Register now for the 2024 Pass the Wire Kentucky Derby Seminar. In-depth analysis of every horse, contenders, pretenders, live long shots, and more. The Kentucky Derby Seminar on PassTheWire.com. Reserve your seat today. Remember, nobody does it better. Solo Mini, a top 10 first crop sire in 2023, standing at McMahon of Saratoga. 14 first crop winners, including My Shady Lady, My winner Shady of the $500,000 New York Stallion Series Fifth Avenue Stakes, Grade 2 winner, Winstock, and Stakes winner, Solo Shot, Solo Mini the seventh leading freshman sire and the only top 10 freshman sire with a grade one or grade two winner. He sired a $700,000 two-year-old at the OBS April sale. His juveniles sold for nearly six figures on average, more than 12 times the stud fee. Solomini, a controversial DQ from being a grade one winner by two-time horse of the year, Curlin standing at McMahon of Saratoga Thoroughbred. Thank you for visiting Pass the Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PassTheWire.com. All right, welcome in to the Kentucky Derby panel. I am Jim Gazali alongside Keeneland Dan from Fat Bald Guy Racing and Ed DeRosa from Horse Racing Nation. Guys, welcome to Pass the Wire. Appreciate you uh, joining me and, and spending some time uh, talking about the Derby. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Us. Thanks for dealing with my boomer orientation. <laughs> I figured it out, though. We're back. So I am, uh, I am filling in for, for John, who, who sends his uh, regrets. He was not able to join us for this. Um, I've been picking more winners along the, uh, the Derby prep races than, than he has. So uh, a suitable replacement, at least in my opinion. Uh, but he did want me to, uh, you know, run some of these, uh, these nicknames that, that he has for you guys. So, Ed, we'll, we'll start with you. Ed Stats and <laughs> Fair Odds DeRosa, uh, welcome to the show. I wear proudly. Thank you. Yeah. Love, love the stats. Uh, love the hundred point lines. Uh, even started it for this year's Derby field, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into. So thanks for having me. And Keeneland, not fat, still bald, Dan. <laughs> That's great. I hope I can keep it off. <laughs> and John, just to, uh, to get in on the, uh, the silliness He's referring to himself as pick six plays, pick six twice a year, King John, because he only plays the pick six on Breeders' Cup Saturday and Kentucky Derby Day now. So it's now the time that, to play it. Yeah. 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 That's true. So now that uh, now that all the intros are are out of the way, let's let's dive in and, and talk about. The big race here coming up in, in less than three weeks, the Kentucky Derby, uh, 150th running of the race. Uh, at least in my opinion, it seems like there's fewer potential win candidates this year than, than in years past. And I think I've narrowed it down to, you know, maybe three, four, maybe five uh, with Sierra Leone at, at the top of my list. Um, you know, Ed, let, let's start with you. Who, who do you have on, on that short list? And, you know, maybe even perhaps it's uh, a bit longer than, than three, four or five, like it is for me. Yeah. I, I uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people are zeroing in on fierceness or Sierra Leone is the likely favorite. I think it'll be fierceness, but I've seen a lot of talk of them being the top two by far. Uh, for me, I, I disagree with that take. I think fierceness is the, the best horse. Uh, and I totally understand uh, the trepidation about two of his not so great races that have led into two of his great races. Uh, so based on that pattern, uh, we're due for a not so great race in the Derby. In my mind, though, that only helps his price. Uh, if he ran like the juvenile in Florida Derby every time, he'd probably be three to two going into this race. But we have the couple clunkers to darken the form. 
And I think we're going to get a square price that he doesn't run one of those clunkers. So for me, he's definitely the most likely winner. As always, uh, regardless of what race you're betting, question comes down to the price you want and, you know, how you can maybe hook him up with other horses who are going to be under bet. But I, I see him as the clear choice at this point. I, I can't disagree with that, Ed uh, and Jim. I, I, I think fierceness is the clear horse to beat on numbers. I love the fact that he's only got two preps. Um, you know, that five rag and that 110 buyer just, just scream off the page. The, ol the only thing that makes me nervous, and this is a very short sample, of course, since they've been really testing these horses, and I mean really putting them through the ringer here, We've had two dead closers win the race, and the speed horses have have dead stopped. That's the only thing that makes me nervous, and I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, <laughs> but it just makes me nervous that, you know, as we used to call it, the I won't use the name, but the certain shake or the certain juice or whatever, you turn from home and you scream and, you know, the juice is loose and all the other fun stuff we used to scream. Um there is none. So when they turn for home, can fierceness keep going? If those other speed horses go with him, uh, he could he be another holy bull that just seems to be unlucky a lot of times? That stuff happens in the Derby. So while he's on top for me, I've got a couple prices that I'm really starting to zero in that, you know, as John likes to play the pick six on big days, I love to play the pick fives. Um, and spread out and take some shots and then find a single earlier, uh, like a Jackie's Warrior or something like that. Uh, you know, we'll find one in one of them prelim races that, that looks like they can't lose to where you can zero in on fierceness, but then take some other shots. And I think there's some other horses we can go over. Yeah, I think fierceness for me, in his races where he's he's run off the, the screen, everything's seemingly gone his way. And when he, you know, faces a little adversity, uh, we've seen a, a couple of clunkers from him, um, you know, likely favorite, uh, you know, might just be splitting hairs between him and, and Sierra Leone, uh, as far as what odds we're going to get, um, 20 horse field needs to be, be forward. I don't know. A lot of kind of question marks for me around fierceness, but oh, go I ahead. feel like, yeah, I feel like one of the, for lack of a better term, good things, if you're not a fierceness believer, is if you don't like him, he's a toss. Like, he is not a horse. You're going to make a case against winning and then use second in the exacta. I mean, right. he, if, if you right. don't think he's going to run his race, he's nowhere in the numbers. So that's right. exciting from a wagering standpoint because you get the favorite out of there. Whereas for me, I do like fierceness better than Sierra Leone. It's not a question. I'm like I feel that way, period. But with Sierra Leone, it's not like you can say, well, he can't even hit the number. He's going right. to be running late. Chad Brown's going to have him ready. He finally has a horse. And uh, I picked, I forget the name of it, Highly Motivated was my pick that year. He wasn't a mile and a quarter horse. I took a shot. Sierra Leone is a mile and a quarter horse. So you know he's going to keep running. So whereas with Fierceness, if you don't like him, you can pitch. With Sierra Leone, I don't love the fact he's going to be the second choice, seven to two ish, but hard to argue that he's not going to be running and could very easily be second or third, even if he doesn't win. Yeah. Yeah. And even, you know, you made a, made a good point earlier about, you know, hooking fierceness up with some horses underneath uh, that, that could, you know, you can have the favorite on top and still get paid. Like we saw, um, with uh, with California Chrome comes to mind. Uh, I think he went off at two to one or three to one, and and that trifecta still paid thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars with the with the favorite on top. So, um, Ed, what are what are some strategies that you like to use? You know, it sounds like you're probably going to play fierceness on top. Um, what are some strategies that you use to kind of make it worth your while with the horses in, in second, third, and, and beyond? A lot of uh, our our fellow colleagues and people we like to mix it up with on uh, Twitter slash Horse Racing X, uh, you know, some of them will, will tell you that the Derby is just another race or there's other opportunities and don't get hung up on it. 
I couldn't disagree more. Uh, and I don't work for Churchill anymore, so you can't even say I'm saying this is a show for the company. I don't understand if you like gambling on horses, how you don't get completely energized by the thought of a 20 horse field with some of the most casual money in the pools that you will get all year. Uh, that obviously the variance is great. Uh, it doesn't just cause you have a, a slight edge, maybe, uh, doesn't mean you're going to hit or win. you're still gambling. Uh, but for me, this is the race where you can go into it knowing that if you're right, you're going to make a score. So I'm excited to bet it, even if, even as I'll have some tickets with fierceness on top. Uh, but my approach when I do like one of the likely favorites, as I do this year, is I am looking to to key him on top of some prices underneath. Uh, but then I, I think there's enough money in the pool where you can diversify a little bit. And horses like Honor Marie and Epic Ride, who I'm a little interested in and who are going to be 20, 30 to one horses, I'll box the four or five long shots I like in an exacta. Cause if you get the two 30 to ones in there, you're going to get out for the race. So, uh, you know, I am looking at fierceness as a potential key forever young, I would say is the other one, uh, even though I'm usually against the UAE Derby. Uh, but for me, the, when I like the logicals, I'm looking to key them with the long shots, but I always do an insanity insurance box with the four or five, 20 or 30 to one horses that I think could shock the world. Dan, you mentioned that there were some long shots that you liked already. Yeah. Yeah. I, one of them I'll mention real quick is just steel um, for coach that Arkansas Derby, at least on numbers was just another race, nothing big. But when you look how fast they came home, Just Steele was really running at the end. And I'm not big into the miles per hour and all that stuff. But a guy sent me that and he's like, you know, Just Steele is one of the top three horses miles per hour from the top of the stretch to the wire. So that kind of got in my head a little bit. And I'm looking over at 20 or 30 to one. And I'm thinking, well, if he could keep running, when a lot of them aren't going to be running, and it's coach, so he'll have them ready. I, I think Just Steele's got a big chance to hit the board and could be a definite third, fourth try super type type horse. And I'm even going to put him into a, a 50 cent pick five in case I can strike the moon. Um, because it, like like Ed said, if, if, if you don't like fierceness or you think there's any chance that one of the top two can't win or, or won't win, this is the race. You've got to take chances. You know, everybody was was laughing at me and my buddy that we had all in the Derby of the year, and we hit for 110,000, and we got cheated because it was 127,000 until they scratched a 99 to one at the gate, and then all the money went on to the horse that we needed, so it went all the way down to 110. We lost 17,000 because some rat scratched, but we still won 110, and all we did was we singled a first time starter, a Brad Cox. I love betting. I call it the late, late pick five. I think that's a better bet than the late pick five because 90% of the people to bet the late, late pick five are drunk. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. They're drunk. They're at the track or they're at a party and they're losing and they're like, oh, hey, don't forget about this pick five, everybody. And they all start just taking wild horses. And you that, that late, late pick five, especially if you can zero in on a horse or two, after the Derby and there's always one of them information horses in those races that you can zero in on. Hell roses for May was in that a few years back. I know I'm kind of dating myself with that, but I mean, we had strobe written down for three months waiting for him to enter. And when we saw that my eyes went through the roof, like, Oh my God. So we singled Jackie's warrior and singled strobe. Well, we just said to hell with it for one ticket. Let's hit all in the Derby. Why not? Like Ed said, you got to take some shots. That's the race to take shots. So Just Steele's going to be on some tickets. Mystic Dan's going to be on some tickets. Door Knock's going to be on some tickets. And I know everybody's against Door Knock now. But you got to understand, they told Saez not to send him. That was straight from the barn. I mean, he didn't even hide it. He told everybody. And then when they opened the gate, you could see Saez grab him. Well, what if he doesn't grab him in the derby and Fierce's stumbles? You got a 20, 25 to one shot that's a quality animal that's now in his setting on the lead. 
I mean, that's the kind of stuff I, I envision in a derby where I'm not a big trifecta player, but I do want to make excuses for some horses to add into pick fours and pick fives to try to blow it up. I mean, the Thunder Gulch year, everybody threw Thunder Gulch out. Uh, when Pat Day win with the what, – what's the name of the horse that won the – the uh, Turfway race. Lowly T. Yeah, that is. I mean, everybody was throwing him out. And it's like, those are the kind of horses at 15 to 20 to 1 that if you can just make a little excuse for, you can get a hell of a price. And right now, Just Steel, Mystic Dan, and Doorknock, to me, are those horses that you can make some big excuses for them. And if the top two don't fire, look out. Anybody can win then. And I think uh, fans of Bob Baffert are certainly going to be cheering for Just Steel and Mystic Dan because uh, that would uh, sh- kind of show that Muth uh, would have been a, a major player in Louisville. So uh, love the storylines that come with all this, too. Yeah, Doorknock is an interesting one. I kind of read those comments from uh, Danny Gargan a little bit differently leading into the bluegrass. Um, it seemed like... At- at least my interpretation and he was almost just kind of hedging like, Oh, we're going to try something new with this horse. So don't worry about it if he doesn't win, but looking at the form, it just seemed like the horse was overmatched. Uh, I don't know that we can necessarily read too much about <clears throat> that win from him against, you know, four other horses or whatever it was at, uh, at Gulf stream. Um, so I took a little bit of a different angle and, um, you know, perhaps it's just some, you know, uh, biases of my own that I'm just trying to confirm with, a you know, what seemingly was a, a subpar effort. Um, uh, I but- more agree with you. I, I, I don't like to see that kind of backward move, uh, change in tactics. It- I don't either, but at 20, 25 to <laughs> no. one, you know, to me, it's just a toss, you know, just. I call them flyers. You take a flyer. You sure. Take, take two or three no, flyers. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be playing Epic Ride, uh, you know, and it's not like he was any any match for the top two in the bluegrass. But like you said, a, a couple horses stumble, and he ends up being the the one to get first run, sort of that two fills run last year without a mage breathing down his neck. I mean, maybe he gets brave and, and shocks the world at a big price. But uh, like you said, I mean, that this, this is the race, the – you know, the, these 30 to ones could key a five, six figure score. I'm really curious to see what price Encino goes off if he if he runs. Because once Epic Ride ran well in the bluegrass, I was convinced Encino could not lose the Lexington. I was just convinced I, I made every bet possible on him. And I just think he can run all day long. He's not going to stop. So he's another one that if he's – two, three, four, five out of the gate, and he's bred to run all day long. And we all know Brad Cox is, I mean, he could be another mandaloon just like just – I wish just a touch was a little bit higher price, um, but I'm not I'm not throwing Brad Cox out of tickets when I'm bet, when I'm throwing some flyers in there. Yeah. He has catching freedom too, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, how do you – with no Bafferts in there, how do you not take Brad Cox's if, you, if you're going to take three or four or five horses? You know, I mean, he's going to get his derby fair and square. It's going to happen. So, I mean, he may end up with five or six of them before it's before it's all done. Yeah. Yeah, I was interested in Encino when he was entered in the, in the bluegrass before scratching out. I thought he was going to um, – you know, not necessarily beat Sierra Leone, but uh, I thought he was definitely sitting on a big effort. And I think the Lexington kind of proved that. And also to your point, Dan, with the what what Epic Ride was able to do in the bluegrass kind of confirmed that. Um, Ed, you mentioned Forever Young. You know, Japanese horses has never won the Derby. A horse prepping at the, the UAE Derby has, has never won the Kentucky Derby. Uh, Forever Young is is on the grounds at, at Churchill Downs, took a spin around the track. It looked like yesterday. Um, what's What's got you sort of bucking all of those negative trends this year? <laughs> yeah, and, and especially for me, I mean, I'm as, you know, those who might remember, I'm extremely bearish on the UAE path uh, to Kentucky. Uh, the quick turnaround off that kind of shift, having to stretch out to a mile and a quarter, 
it, it's not like when horses show up again at Saratoga after running in the Dubai World Cup or in the Golden Shaheen, uh, and they've had months to, you know, ship back and get acclimated. This is a quick turnaround, but he's going to be eight or nine to one. Uh, the way Fierceness and Sierra Leone bit, both ran after he won the UAE Derby definitely made his price longer. And I just look at what we saw in Saudi and then the, the progression at UAE. Uh, he was close to the runner up each time. And then it was a long way back to third. His Ragazin numbers are clearly the second best other than Fierceness. What is I it? Just, Ed? Like six, six and six. So I just, I can't, you know, as a Ragazin devotee, can't let a horse with the paired sixes, which is the fastest pairing of any horse in the field, beat me at nine to one. And, you know, 0 for 19 UAE Derby horses since 2000, none better than fifth. That was Master of Hounds. One other was sixth. That was last year with Derma Sotagake. Plenty of lasts. Plenty of man. That what were they doing in this race? They weren't ready. Uh, th- this horse does feel different to me, uh, and I've gone down with the Apollo ship both in Justify and Mages years. I tossed them both completely, so I'm trying to be open minded year to year. And for me, Forever Young just feels like a horse to be more open minded on on this path. Yeah, wasn't it? Uh... Wasn't it thunder snow that came from the UAE Derby and, you know, was pr- prancing out of the gate and, uh, and yeah. that was it. Yeah. DNF. And I mean, he had, he had tons of buzz, uh, you know, Mendelssohn who I, I didn't pick, but uh, was an A on my grid and, you know, I fell for him and he showed nothing in the Derby. It, it is just a really tough ship, but this horse was in Japan, then Saudi, then UAE uh, every year that, the technology to move people and animals around the world gets better and better. Uh, eventually you have to think a horse who's shown this kind of talent is going to be able to show it in Louisville as well. And that's a difference too. I mean, Derma Sotogake, who, and you know, it's a fine six, his numbers weren't remotely uh, competitive with two fills or mage uh, forever. Young is very competitive with this group. Yeah. Uh, Dan, how do you see the, the pace of, of this race shaping up. I, I went back and looked uh, at some Equibase race charts from the last, you know, 20 years or so. And there was only one derby in the last 20 years. Uh, it was Animal Kingdom's year where they went 48 to the half. And there's only been, you know, three, maybe four times where it was, you know, 47 and change. Uh, all the other years it's been... 46 and change. So I would assume that it would probably, at least with, you know, the, the amount of front end speed, it looks like that's going to be in here. That would be pretty quick. Do you see it similarly, similarly, or, or are you looking at it a, a bit different? Well, there's not a ton of speed. I don't think in here. Um, but the ones that are speed, I think are pretty quick. So uh, I, I I'd probably, 46 and four, 46 and three. I don't think fierceness will be able to clear them at 47 and change, but uh, I've been wrong the last two years on the pace. I didn't think it was going to be that fast. And they, the one uh, two years ago, the, the horses just ran off, uh, which probably set it up for the closers, right? In both years. But I, I don't think it'll be crazy, but I don't think it's going to be slow. I, I would say somewhere in the, in the 46 and, High 46s with uh, Track Phantom, Doorknock, Fierceness. Did I miss anybody? I think I think those three will probably be up there. Encino? I think Encino will be in that fifth area, fifth, sixth area. Um, Epic Ride, I think, will be close. Uh, I wish they just let him run. I, I mean, he, he could be one of them that could steal it wire to wire if they just let him go when the gate opened. But uh, they keep trying to grab him, and I'm not. I, I'm just not a fan of that. After uh, Speed Horse shows speed, sprinting, and then they take him a route, and they grab yeah. him. I don't. I don't like that too much. But he's got a. He he'll be forward. I don't think Mystic Dan will be that far back. Um, Resilience should be somewhere up there near the lead. But I mean, there's no real burners other than Track Phantom, maybe Doorknock and Fierceness. 
I mean, I, I think they'll be one, two, three if they all get a fair start. Um, I know one thing. If I was riding Doorknock or even Just a Touch or Encino, there's no way I would let Fiercest get to the half in 47 and change a length in front. I would be right next to him. Uh, there's no way I would let him walk. But it's the Derby. Sometimes they, they, they all got their own instructions and they don't worry about who's in front. Well, I, I have to think uh... – I mean, I don't know how quick he can be and when he can be quick enough to get to fierceness under your scenario, but I have to think the rider of domestic product, who I believe is our head Ortiz, uh, is going to have some instructions to go sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's um, true. I mean, we know Chad, you know, used his horse as a, as a quasi rabbit in the bluegrass. Um, domestic product doesn't have that kind of speed, but. I mean, Chad's a tactician. He's he's going to give Sierra Leone the best chance to win he can. Do you think Cox will do that with either just a touch or Encino for catching freedom? That's yeah. I mean, that works to to his ad, advantage as well. So it's a it's a fair question. Yeah, and I would say <laughs> yes. I mean, I we saw last year. Uh, I, I mean, Kings Barnes clearly was was used as a rabbit. Um, you know, and that, that was Pletcher. So that's a little different than Brad or, or Chad, but, uh, you know, clearly with these multiple horses, uh, they're, they're moving them around like chess pieces. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Catching freedom has always been kind of interesting to me along the, the Derby trail. And then I thought his Louisiana Derby was, was pretty impressive. Um, and I, I think he's got a good shot to be, moving pretty well towards the end and, and, you know, definitely sneak into the, the superfecta, you know, perhaps even, even win it. I think he's one of the, you know, three, four or five horses I've got on, on my short list. Um, well, and the, I mentioned briefly, but the horse he beat in Louisiana, Anna Marie, uh, I definitely think is, is at least going to be value. Um, yeah. you know, we'll see how well he runs. I'm not sure if you gentlemen, you know, were, were too in tune with what was going on before the Risen Star Stakes, uh, but he had a disastrous final workout. Um, you know, some things conspired against him. I think there was a loose horse and rider misunderstood directions. So a bunch of things going on. And he worked with Drip, who won first time out. Uh, but, you know, to me, the Risen Stars a throw out. And then to see how well he ran the Louisiana Derby, knowing there were issues into the three-year-old debut, um, and that's far enough back that other than, you know, us guys that are really into it and know that was going on, uh, that that's not going to show up in the price. Like people don't know he, he really needed that one in the risen star. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm bullish on him and, um, I, there's a chance he ends up even being my top pick, I would say. Oh, wow. I had him written down as a long shot. Cause I, again, I love the two preps. He's only got two preps. And like you said, one of them was in the slop and he had all these issues. So he's really only got one solid prep and then a long time off. I mean, you know, Louisiana Derby to the Kentucky Derby is a long time. Those horses change. And what is that? Six weeks. <laughs> six uh, weeks. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a ton of time for a horse to grow up. And at 20 or 25 to one, I, I couldn't knock yet. I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't be laughing if you made it the top pick. <laughs> I, and I, mean, I I mean, I like catching freedom. Like I, I get the talents there. He's going to be fifth choice. Like he's, he's in the mix for sure. Um, and I, I mean, this is a extreme example, but I feel like I, I need to learn a lesson from when I picked his, the bond uh, and the horse he beat in the prep uh, came back to win at 80 to one. Speaking of rich strike, uh, we're not quite looking at that situation here with catching freedom and honor Marie, but you know, to me, if you like, the race catching freedom ran. There's nothing wrong with Anna Marie at three times the price. If, if you, if you made me take one of the Cox horses, it wouldn't be catching freedom. It would be just a touch. Okay. Um, justify. We know that sire, right? And I just love the rising numbers. I love that we have not seen the best of him yet. He's only run three times. I love that the first two were in the slop. So we really don't know how good he is. <laughs> Then he's in the bluegrass. So when they turned for home, I thought he was going to win until I saw the monster on the outside. And then I knew I was dead. 
But this horse is bred to run all day. He's Brad Cox. To me, he screams Mandaloon. He, he looks so much like Mandaloon to me, at least, in his running style and his breeding and the way he just methodically just keeps going. He's not going to stop. Um, I wish his price was higher, but he's on the short list for me um, of the four or five I think can, can win. I think he'll be 10 to 1. I mean, that's that's perfect for every bet you make. Exact as tries, pick fours, fives. I mean, if you can beat Fierceness or Sierra Leone, the pick fives are going to be through the moon because every human, especially the smaller players, are only going to use those two because they don't have the budget to do it. So they're just going to hit those two and be done with it. If you can get that third or fourth choice home, it, 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 it could the, the payouts are going to go through the moon. Yeah. How does, um, <clears throat> how does kind of each circuit that we've seen through the, the Derby trail kind of play into both of your handicapping and analysis of the Derby? Um, do you kind of weigh horses prepping in, you know, Florida, New York, Louisiana, uh, California differently than, than others, or you just kind of throw them all into you know, the, the same bucket and, and handicap it that way. At least for me, I look at the Florida Derby and the bluegrass a lot harder than the rest of them and, and try to make excuses for those horses. Uh, the Louisiana Derby this year was a lot better than it's been. So you have to kind of look at that. And the San Anita Derby was awful. So I just, <laughs> I'm not taking anything from out there. Um, if one of them hit the try or, or, or win, I'm just going to lose. Um, but that's kind of the way I, I do that. The, the Arkansas Derby this year, I, I'm taking the second, third place finishers as my flyers. So I obviously think that race was better than most people are giving it credit for. But uh, the echelon would be Florida Bluegrass Arkansas Derby. I would say I'm more, uh, I mean, my style of handicapping, since I rely so much on, on numbers, you know, to me it is sort of throw them all in a bucket and who do you like? Uh, I do think once you, for me, once I distill like, oh man, fierceness is the nuts. Okay. Then need to take a closer look at, at that region. Uh, but they didn't really run against each other. Hades, you know, luckiest win you'll ever, you'll ever get, um, you know, in terms of being able to win that day and what he's done since, you know, it's not like I'm interested in him. Doorknock beat Ladombro who, you know, fierceness drubbed. So that, that's a little tougher. I will say the Wood Memorial, um, you know, unfortunately, and I do think it's happenstance, even though it's it's years on. Uh, but in the points era, they have yet to have a horse hit the board, let alone contend to win. I don't know what's going on with the Wood Memorial, but uh, th this year does not appear to be the year that's going to re reverse that trend. Um, so that that would be if, you know, gun to my head. I would say the the lowest ranking prep for me, but I'm I'm more inclined to just you know look look at it as a PP page and and not necessarily worry about where they prepped. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know as a, a New York guy myself, it's it's a shame to see just you know how weak really the the New York preps have been over over the last handful of years. Um, <clears throat> what about what about post position? I know a lot of people kind of hem and haw about, you know, the, the one post or the 20 post uh, back when they had that auxiliary gate, it was the, the 14 post. Um, do you guys make, make a big deal about that? And is there any specific horse that you would play one way or another, depending on um, where they're positioned in the gate? I like making a big deal about it because it gets your clicks and stuff. But uh, <laughs> I mean, that really, I love it. I mean, I guess I will say with fierceness because he does have two races that you know are really disappointing against the curve of what we know he's capable of. The rail would would seem to be a widow maker for him. Um, you know, I'm I'm sort of tepidly thinking, oh, is five to two worth playing him? Well, if he's three to one on the rail, that's way worse than five to two anywhere else. So 
I would say of everything, uh, the, the rail for him would, would be the worst. And then with horses like Sierra Leone, uh, catching freedom, it, it, it doesn't matter nearly as much. I mean, they're, they're hoping to get position, save some ground, and then make a run. Yeah, other than the one hole, I don't, I don't think anything's that big of a deal. Now, a speed horse uh, in the 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, I, I don't really like that too much because they do have a lot of ground to cover to, to get over. Um, but it's not that big of a deal. This, I don't want my horse on the rail. I don't want the one or two hole. But other than that, I just want them to break. That's all, that's all I say every time. Please come out when the gate opens. Uh, <laughs> I've had so many over the years go to their knees when I need big money, and uh, it's so frustrating. Just give me a fair start. That's all I care about. Ed, I'm curious about your your fair odds um, and what your process is in kind of getting to to those numbers for for each specific horse. You have like sort of like a, a formula that that you use to arrive at that, um, or you just you know institutional yeah. knowledge helps you get there. I mean, I, I handicap and I actually start um, you know before I'm thinking oh three to one on this one specifically. I do think in terms of sort of grouping A, B, C, you know, most likely winner, contenders, no chance, um, which like TO password. Uh, Dan, I know you love the all button, save yourself, whatever cost of combination. I mean, this horse sh shipping from Japan uh, with what, three months rest, never been past uh, eight and a half furlongs. Like I, I haven't met a like a, a complete shock anyway. Uh, but once I see how I have the contender stacked up, then that's where I'll start like actually pricing it. And with this race, like I said, I, I think fierceness is the most likely winner and I do not see Sierra Leone is, is right there with them. So I made him sort of the second tier with forever young catching freedom and just a touch. So fierceness, I think is three to one on my fair odds line. And then it's seven, eight, and nine to one on the others. Whereas I think when that race actually gets bet, it'll probably be closer to three to one, seven to two, Sierra Leone and the others ten to one. So I have some decisions to make in terms of who I'm, you know, most excited to bet. If Forever Young's eleven to one, well, how can I say no if Fierceness is five to two? So uh, th that's sort of what I'm thinking about now. But yeah, to, to answer your question, I sort of compartmentalize them into contender ranks. And then from there, price it and just, you know, think to myself, okay, I have 20 to one on Anna Marie. Would I really be excited to bet him at that price? And then adjust accordingly if, you know, yeah, I would take 16. So if I would, then that's what he has to be. Yeah. Uh, Dan, you have a, a process where you kind of map out your, your top win contenders and your, you know, potential long shots to, to fill out the exotics. What's your, you know, standard operating procedure to sort of build your tickets and your wagers. Yeah, I do a lot of the same thing Ed does. I just don't put odds on it. I, I put them in the top, who I think is the top pick in the race. Then the A horses to me are the horses that if you're playing a legitimate pick four, pick five, pick three type deal, you want them on your ticket. And then the B horses are kind of, they could win. They could run third if you're betting tries. If you're a guy that likes to stab some prices, I try to put them in the order that I would take them if I'm betting. So it might be Fiercest on top, Just Steel second, Mystic Dan, you know, a door knock, somebody like that is the Flyers to where, I, yeah, okay, the favor may win, but I got a 20, 25 to one that I'm also needing in the money if, if for the try. And I, and I kind of do it that way. Um, and again, I'm not a big trifecta player. The Derby is one of the few races all year that I'll bet a trifecta, um, like Ed said, because I'm just trying to hit the moon. <laughs> so, you know, I'll bet a, I'll bet a ticket with Fierceness on top with those long shots, second, third, and then I'll throw Fierceness out and I'll put all three long shots on top with a bunch of horses, second and third. And and that's my that's my strike the moon ticket. Um, and then I like to play the pick five the same way where whoever I like on top, I'll play one ticket to just get to him. That's how I hit with American Pharaoh. That's how I hit with Street Sense um, to where I just 
spread like mad in the other three or four races and just get me to him. And then I'll flip it completely, find a single earlier, and then try to take, if I can afford all, if I find two races earlier, you know, I'll, then I'll hit the all button and try to try to strike the moon that way. Or I'll just take four or five of them, but I'm not taking the four or five choices. That, that just kind of defeats the purpose. You know, you may take the first two, but then in here, you got to, you got to like an honor Marie or a, a mystic Dan or a Justy or even a catching freedom or just a touch, anything that's 10 to one or above. I, I don't want three to, you know, three to one, three and a half, six, eight, ten as my five horses. You know, I want to see a pick five up there on a will pay uh, just like <laughs> yesterday. I mean, if that Turfway horse wins the last yesterday, I get eighty six thousand dollars. Didn't run a step, but I had the two favorites. So I had to take a flyer. And that's kind of the way I played it. And that's the way I play it in the Derby. I want a flyer or two on my ticket that, you know, to try to get lucky. It's that day that you got to try to get lucky. The other thing I'll say about that in the verticals is, and this applies every day, um, but, you know, in, in the Derby, what I think about, like, obviously, I respect Sierra Leone. I don't like them as much as some others, uh, you know, fair odds, seven or eight to one, whereas others are, are bullish and thinking three to one is fine. But with a horse like Honor Marie, uh, I actually agree with Dan on Jeff Steele as well. Like, if, if Just Steele and Anna Marie are in the try with Sierra Leone, I don't want to be ripping up tickets. Now, you can't use Anna Marie with them all, obviously. Uh, but I do think, and this just comes, you know, it's about planning and thinking about how you're going to bet, not just how you're handicapping the race. But, you know, you can you can spare some units for like, man, if, if the 30 to 1 I like really runs well. And it's Anna Marie, Sierra Leone, and Epic Ride, let's say, because I like him too. I, I don't want to miss that try. So I do spend some time structuring with my long shots, knowing like, okay, yeah, Sierra Leone's an underlay in the wind pool to me. But if I hook them up with, you know, two of the long shots I like, I, I can't miss. Um, and, and typically, you know, all said and done, that costs an extra 50 to 100 bucks. But me and my buddies pull our money together. That's just a small percentage of the overall play. Uh, but I really encourage people don't, you know, when you really, and I'm not saying use five or six long shots with all the favorites, but the one or two you really like, and you recognize that, yeah, this horse has a shot, even though I don't love him at the win price, uh, figure it out. Yeah. Um, I was pretty high on, on mage last year. I, I had a, a future wager on him in one of the, the early, uh, Derby future pools. Um, so built some tickets around him and, and did pretty well, but kind of, Piggybacking off of your your comments, Dan, what, what I like to do, and I only really ever play the trifectas on um, on Derby Day and and on the Breeders' Cup days. Um, what I try to do is find that one sort of board hitter that I think is going to for sure finish in, in first, second, or third, and just single him in in each position in trifecta tickets with, um, you know, a variety of, of other kind of long shots around him. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, proper betting strategy or, or etiquette long-term, but there's so much, like you said, there's so much, you know, drunk money, dead money, casual money in these pools that on these big days, it's almost worth taking that, that shot and, and trying to, you know, string together a, a solid, you know, big payoff, I think. No, I, I, I agree. And, and I think the, the, the key to that is the key. Uh, right. So many people, uh, and, and God bless them. I mean, we, we all want people to enjoy the race and have fun and bet however, uh, you know, brings them fun or makes it easy. But, you know, we all, we all know, you know, people at the track, our friends, whatever, they're boxing four, five, six, seven, eight horses in the try and super. They're not thinking about structure, which is fine. You wouldn't expect them to. I'm not saying they should. Uh, but I go back to the year that Hollendorfer horse finished fourth. Uh, I forget his name, but he ended up in Chad Brown's barn. Uh, and it was Justify, uh, Good Magic, Audible, and then the bomb in fourth. And the Superfecta, 
I forget what it paid, but, you know, compared to the trifecta, which was the top three betting choices, it was astronomical. Like it was a superfecta you absolutely would brag about hitting. And it took one no hoper to be fourth, no less. And the reason it paid so much is because so many people box eight, 10, 12 horses. They threw him out. All those superfectas are out the window. Uh, whereas that horse could have finished fourth. Like that wasn't the upset of the century by any means. So if you're thinking about keying long shots, it makes perfect sense. And you're eliminating all those people who box eight or 10 horses that don't use your horse. So yeah. I'm all for it. I think it's a great approach. Was that, uh, was that Danza? No, that Danza was year? Chrome's year. He finished third to commanding curve. I think it began with an I. Mm. Um, fourth in 2018 yeah um all right as we we wrap up here i'll uh, i'll put you each on the spot not going to ask for a winner just yet but uh curious if you have at least one bold derby prediction at this point um i'll start with mine to give you guys a another minute or two to to think about yours i think uh, Danny Gargan's other horse, Society Man, is going to finish ahead of Doorknock. That's my bold pr- a good prediction one. for for the Derby this year. Uh, Ed, what do you got? I'll say, uh, and this kind of dovetails into the the sports betting uh, scene that we've seen explode over the last couple of years. If racing got its act together and and got involved in some you know proposition wagers for its biggest races. I would take an odds boost on fierceness winning this race gate to wire. I think based on the trouble we've, we've seen uh, the, the clunkers, you know, the disappointing races, why not just take it to him if you think you have a mile and a quarter horse. So I'd love to get a price on him winning gate to wire. Hmm. I mean, if he's going to win, he probably will. You're right. Um, I guess for a bold prediction, cause I, I agree with Ed. I think fierceness is going to win. I think Just Steel or Mystic Dan is going to be in the exacta or try, but I really think that one of those two are going to run second. So I'm going to try to nail that exacta fierceness over Just Steel and Mystic Dan. Hey, huge. What are you yeah. going to do if Mystic Dan takes my boy Jack money? <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm hoping those exactas are, you know, at least 70 or $80. Oh gotta be was in uh my boy jack he was at uh new jersey horse right i think like all of new jersey was was betting on him i mean i've heard people say it's because people named jack but yeah that I, too. I, I, I don't I think forever I young is gonna take a bunch of money i think he may go off six seven to one mm. yeah he's the enigma to me i mean at, at ten to one i i have to play given the the rags and numbers but if you know, he's if he's a clear third choice, it like you said, six or seven, I, I'm going to be less uh, less excited. But uh, man, that but between you know the the Baffert situation, coach having a, a legitimate long shot threat in here, the Japanese horse, like the the storylines are are delicious. Yes, they are. I can't yeah. wait. Yeah, a lot of intrigue over the next uh, less than three weeks now. Um, so. We'll all uh, get our noses in the the PPs and try and uh, craft some some winning wagers. Uh, Ed, just uh, before we wrap up here, what uh, what do you guys have going on at uh, Horse Racing Nation over the next couple of weeks in the lead up to the Derby? Yeah, our, our big thing is uh, Mike Shotty Super Screener uh, product. We're we're really proud of. He puts a lot of effort into not only crunching the numbers, so the data geeks have a bunch of stuff to look at, uh, but he fashions himself a, a writer as well, which he absolutely is. I, I love his uh, style of writing about how he handicaps a race. Uh, so looking forward to what he comes up with. And I do know, because uh, the early derby's out, uh, you know, he screened, I think, the top 24 by points. Uh, he and I are aligned. I'm one of the long shots I've mentioned. So I, w- I won't give away the store, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to be on uh, Team Shuddy for one of the prices we both like. Nice. Um, I've used the screener before and, uh, I do like it. The, the analysis and, and insights is, is very, very helpful, uh, as you're trying to, you know, pour through 
pages and pages and pages of data that you can find, you know, it seems like endless. So that puts it, um, you know, in a nice, easy to read, easy to digest form um, and gives you some some good thoughts to, to move forward with. Uh, Dan, what's going on at uh, Fat Ball Guy Racing over the next couple of weeks? Well, we got, you know, obviously the Keeneland focus and then the, the first week of Churchill. And, and what we really try to focus on as we get closer to the Derby, we call them pot builders, where we try to tell, tell people, look, you're trying to build that pot for Derby week, right? Mm -hmm. You need to bet this horse on Tuesday, this horse on Thursday. You know, don't be firing every race Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we try to stress who to play in the, in the days leading up uh, in our Derby package. And then, of course, we've got the ABC chart. We've got the rolling doubles for smaller players. And, and we try to really put these are the horses to bet on throughout the day, um, especially as the drinks are flowing and people, and people want action. I mean, we used to only do Churchill, Jim, on, on, on Derby weekend. And then it got to where we can't do it because I'm getting 100 emails with, Dan, there's 58 minutes till the next race. Do you like anybody else around the country? <laughs> so we, we try to do the other tracks and really get specific on the races in between them, gigantic gap races to where, okay, we got 90 minutes from the next Churchill race. We got two races up here in New York and one race in Florida. Go bet these horses. Mm -hmm. So people tend to like that because they're at a party and they want action. Um, so that's what we focus on besides just the Derby. Awesome. Well, guys, this was fun. We'll, uh, we'll have to do it again. Good soon. Yeah. Uh, Ed, Dan, thank you both, uh, very much for, for joining past the wire. Good luck with the Derby. Good luck over the next couple of weeks. And, uh, we'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks for having thanks, us. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Appreciate you hosting. Register now for the 2024 Pass the Wire Kentucky Derby Seminar. In-depth analysis of every horse, contenders, pretenders, live long shots, and more. The Kentucky Derby Seminar on PassTheWire.com. Reserve your seat today. Remember, nobody does it better. Nobody does it better.